Welcome to the Ag Week Podcast. We're coming at you from the Crary Full Pod event in West Fargo, North Dakota. Big blizzard outside. It's unbelievable. I'm back in the saddle as the host of the Ag Week Podcast, and I have some very special guests came to join us from um, Minnesota and Ohio. Luckily, it wasn't further because this weather probably would not have allowed it. Um, I'm just going to do some quick introductions, and we'll get going talking about some of the issues you guys are seeing in agriculture. How's that sound? That sounds good to me. Good, because you are Zach Johnson, the Minnesota Millennial Farmer. Next to him, we have Brian Brown from Brian's Farming Videos. He's the Ohio one. Uh, next, we have Chet Larson and Doug Larson next to him from Larson Farms. Uh, they, they are here for the event. They're partners with Crary, and they do a really good job showing what happens on their farm. We've, we've been talking about a lot of different things, but um, running two businesses really is the farm side and the YouTube side of things, managing relationships and all that stuff. So um, this episode, we're going to focus on some of the issues that come up that you're seeing that the rest of the world sees, uh, some of the things that they don't. So let's get started with Larson Farms down on the, the far end. Um, what are the challenges that you're seeing? I'm not going to say financially, just overall, even though we have pretty good commodity prices as of late. Inflation. <laughs> uh, everything, what's happened, everything being more expensive. What, yeah, what's happened in $7 corn or $6 corn is maybe going to be the new $3 corn. When everything goes up $150,000 on equipment, equipment uh, input costs, all that input stuff. Input costs have obviously gone up. But equipment, I would say, is the the biggest thing, you know. I thought five hundred fifty thousand dollar combine was bad. Try a seven hundred thousand dollar one. You gotta own a lot of pieces of equipment to get crops in and out at a timely fashion. What do you think? Yeah, it's uh, <laughs> what we used to pay for a combine has I don't know. It's just all so out of control and we just looked into trading our I was checking to make sure that we shouldn't be trading something and our combine that we bought two years ago is worth about what we paid for it because the new ones have gone up uh, it, I think it was what 300,000 now more mm -hmm. than what that thing should be worth two years ago so it's getting in the way of your your you know renewing your equipment deciding decisions. yeah what to do <coughs> it, it's tempting to trade because we can get out of what we or we can get it's, our money it's back like, out of It's like the pickup paid. I just bought. <clears throat> yeah, I got what I paid for my old one, put 40,000 miles on it. Yeah, the new one's just three times the money, <laughs> twice the money. Well, I, of course, I upgraded, you know, because why not? Right, right. <laughs> but you know what the real problem is? Is that we're still buying the stuff. <laughs> well, what are you going to do? you got to have stuff updated. We've been down the road of 10-year-old combines. We ran our 9870s for 10, 10 and 11 years, I believe, and blew the hydro out of the one called Junkyard. Beautiful combine. It was looked like it just drove off the showroom floor, 2,500 hours on it. Blew the hydro out, 65,000. the steering wheel. Oh, and then oh, he broke the steering wheel off, you know, out of rage. <laughs> uh, so these aren't just luxury purchases, impulse <clears throat> buying, right? This You need... Yeah. Yes, Some and updates. so we let them depreciate because the new was so high and ended up getting a $50,000 repair bill on an $80,000 combine, and we literally called junkyards to see if they would buy the combine from us. Yeah, it's not good when you have to check with the salvage to see if you should <laughs> sell it there instead of fixing it, but uh, I think that's what we're up against now is the new stuff costs so much, but it also... If you have a major breakdown, if your engine now goes to heck on you with the newer stuff, it's a hundred grand. Well, it, it, I don't know where to spend the money, but they'll take it from me one way or the other. So, it has kind of gotten to that point where if you're going to run newer stuff, you almost need it to be new enough that it's under warranty right. for for reasons like that. Not that you have to run newer stuff, but you know, you get into ten years old, that's still a pretty new combine. But if you have a problem with it, yeah. It's and it's not covered. That is tough. Mm -hmm. No, it, we <clears throat> don't look at us to know what 
we're doing because we don't know it. I mean, it's a new we want to be in five year plus newer combines. We want to be in five year to, to new. Is that the right thing to do? I don't know. I know what the 10 year old was costing us and that was not pleasurable. I, I don't know. And now it's hard to stay in that five years to current because when it goes up $100,000 in a year and a half or more. Well, I really thought $6 corn was going to make things pretty easy living, but I don't think, I think we're right. Everything else cut up. We are. We're just yeah. handling more money. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's <clears throat> our risk, more. our reward. Yeah, it's just. Same reward, actually. One bad right. choice away. Just high risk. <laughs> from ending the whole thing. It, I mean, you at this type of level of expense and all that, if you make one bad choice, it's going to maybe end your whole career. Terrifying to think about, really. Yeah. Stuff we have no control over. Just yeah. We really went drastic <clears throat> there. I don't, I don't know about, about that. Doom and <laughs> I don't know if we're in that position. Well, I, I work pretty close with a, a farm management group. We've got about 80 farms together, and we do cash flows and balance sheets and financial analysis stuff. And we're starting to put together cash flows for 23 now. And most guys need $5 corn to break even. Mm -hmm. $6 corn, most guys, it looks pretty good. It looks okay. But, I mean, when you need that, it's a little nerve-wracking because that can disappear in a hurry. We what could have $4 corn pretty quickly. What do you see on the soybean side? We haven't gotten into that enough for me to really say. Okay. Yeah, we just did just for our farm, and that's very close. The $5, a little over $5 is the new, you know, break even. That That's scary to me. Yeah. Uh, soybeans, I don't know why you'd raise them. That's... It's a very scary close number. It's... Yeah, for... It's, it's over 13, break even, for us. Yeah. One yeah. thing with these high prices we have now, like, like you're talking about cash flows and break evens and stuff. I think the guys that are going to get hurt the most are the guys that are buying expensive inputs and they're going to need that high break even. Then when the market does correct, I mean, I know last time it got to where corn was six bucks, people were like, oh, you'll never see corn below four dollars. And I think we sold some corn like two ninety a couple years ago. So yeah. two sixty five. Yeah. I mean, I think the year or two while prices are fluctuating and correcting back to a lower market, I think that's where people are really going to be struggling and hurting. Are you guys seeing a, a raise in those input prices to match? It seems like just a little. <laughs> I mean, beyond normal inflation, like, you know, usually they they go right up with uh, crop prices and then crop prices go down and it was inputs. Like, it was like magic. Slowly. There was a shortage all of a sudden. As soon as corn got above five dollars, it was really crazy. That is nuts, isn't stuff, it? Huh? Yeah. All of a sudden, Roundup was hard to get too. Yeah. <laughs> It's been generic for 15 years. Like. Right, right. Yeah, for fertilizer for us, I mean, we, we're double for 23 what we were last year. Mm -hmm. It's unreal. How about how about labor? Um, you guys, all of you hire outside help for your farms? Brian, go well, ahead first. Well, I got three kids, so we've got, <laughs> got an investment there. They sound uh, pretty little, but... <laughs> Uh, we have uh, one guy that works for us now. Um, that's a fairly new addition for us, and that's been kind of a godsend. Usually we're scrambling to find harvest help. Uh, we've never really been able to convince ourselves that we need a full-time person until we had one. And I was like, I, whoa, whoa, why did we not do that years ago? So you don't have the before and after for it's more expensive, but you found one, which is I a think that in having, general. Yeah, I think having someone full-time, we are able to do more things that's more than making up for his salary. That's perfect. What more can he ask for? Yep. But Zach, then, or, then sorry, if you want to, like, take the day off, you got to keep the hired guy busy. That is, this, this this week's been a little... It actually causes you to work more. Yeah, like, because somebody else is relying on you to yeah, tell them used, what to do. We and used to, show. you know, like... I know exactly what you're talking about. It's been raining the last two to, weeks at home. I'm like, I don't want to go do anything. We well, used to be over. able <laughs> to, you know, drive around the neighborhood and, you know... It's a rainy afternoon. Let's go drive around. No, that don't happen no more. Because you get somebody to keep busy gotta, and well, not earn, their, earn their paycheck. You feel bad that they're there working and you're okay. screwing off. or Not that it is. I mean, you're you know, you got to check your field sometimes. Right. Yeah. In the middle of February. <laughs> Make sure they're still there. Yep. 
We, we haven't hired anybody full time ever on our farm. So it's just dad and I, we've got seasonal help. Uh, but we, we've been really, really lucky. Our seasonal help has been pretty consistent for the last few years, and we got good guys that help us out. Same crew coming back? The same usually? same guys for the last several years, yeah. yeah. I know around here <clears throat> the big push in the fall is for beet harvest help, driving truck or whatever. And um, I know I, I would say probably 25% price increase or I guess wage increase from what I had been seeing in the past. I've never done it or anything, but I, you know, you see the signs are here, radio ads, whatever people put ads in egg week saying, Hey, we need help. Um, you're giving a lot of people bad ideas. <laughs> I'm just, I'm just telling you that, you know, it's, 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 uh, the same thing in every market, you know, help is hard to find. So, uh, it's great to hear that you're all finding what you need and it's not, I think the part-time stuff is always, that's what a farmer needs. Springtime, they need, Maybe field cultivator operators. I get a lot drivers. of I get a lot of text like from local guys or local friends, brothers or so and so's kids. Like, hey, I'd love to come. You know, run the combine. I bet you would like to come run the <laughs> right. combine. Give me a call and you know how to drive a semi. That's what I'm looking for. <laughs> yeah. Everybody wants the fun job that the they want the grain cart or the combine. Like, yeah, nothing. Well, then it's hard to find people that you can trust because equipment ain't small. And it sure ain't cheap, and it takes and a special those person things, to put <clears throat> in there that you trust. What if something goes wrong? What if it gets dinged up in an accident? Oh, you can't smash your header. You, you smash know, like, something in, uh, you're talking tens of thousands of dollars, not hundreds of dollars. And missed opportunities to get out in the field. <laughs> oh, yeah. Do what they're supposed to be Downtime. doing. Downtime. I get it. One thing it's hard to find, like um, I used to have an uncle that worked for us. He's retired now, but... Um, he was uh, an in my dad's in law, but he treated all of our equipment like it was his own. He took great care of it. That's just, that's really why we never hired anyone after he retired. It was trying to find someone that wasn't just here for a paycheck. Like they were, I mean, you know, doing that. They were going to take care of stuff. They weren't just going to get in the truck and drive it. And oh yeah, the wheel fell off like ten miles ago. But I just kept going and we made it. <laughs> what do you mean? Did that? When did that wheel pop? <laughs> Just I don't know. It's <laughs> it's obviously nothing left of it. Apparently a while ago. And I it, like all the common <laughs> stories that you guys have. It's like you're living the same life in different parts of the world. <laughs> Basically. Um, <clears throat> jumping back to the equipment and, and everything, the cost of money. Um, interest rates high. They just raised, I think, uh, yesterday again. What Another uh, half. How is that impacting the life on your farm, the, the business side of things? So I think that will curve equipment purchases more than anything. Yeah, and land. That's got to slow down land purchases. Yeah. Do you think it will? Well, it would have to if you're talking going from 3% to 7 I mean, you can get a seat <clears> for <throat> like 4%. I mean, I think a lot of people that are just using land as an investment are going to start looking at that route as a lot safer. I think, yeah, it'll change the people who are buying the land for sure. I mean, it'll take the... The guy that don't have any backing out of the game because it's just just on that combine deal that we were thinking about. I think it was like what twenty thousand dollars in interest a year. It just just on that yearly payment. Yeah. Yeah. It's just ridiculous. That's so insane. I think it. Like I was, we were talking about that combine deal, and I'm like, you know, it's maybe better to come in with cash on that and keep the locked in interest rate loans rather than pay on that finance for things yeah, instead of for sure come in with cash because seven three to seven i mean double which is a big flip from the last however long yeah yep. that's historically a, that's low something to look rates. at yep makes sense mm, i don't know my lawn mowing piggy bank from when i was a kid is gone <laughs> I, I have no down payment. <laughs> Get some of those, uh, yeah. Find some people who, who need their lawn mowed again. You could probably find your free time. Job right now. I, I thought we were going to do the lawn mowing autonomously now. I think we should. I think. Yeah. Hire a fleet of those things. Just right. send them out. Um, new markets. How, how are those affecting or, or even changing markets? The Russia-Ukraine thing, Brazil... China, what are you, how is that impacting you guys? Are you super dialed into that aspect of agriculture? 
I, mean, I want to say in our area, there's not a lot of flexibility. I mean, there's only so many things we can sell in a close area, so we're still raising the same things. I mean, uh, wheat took a wheat made money last year. That was a little bit of a change. We always grow wheat, and I was like, oh, this wasn't unprofitable. Nice surprise. Yeah, I was shocked. We're kind of the same way. I mean, the the local market for us wants corn and soybeans. That's what we're growing right now. I would say, like, the comment that I made before with the break-even levels is the soybeans, I, I don't know. The, the, so close, the current market is so close to that break-even. It's I'm doing as much corn on corn as possible next year. Don't, on the don't land. say that. <laughs> Sorry, we're planting all soybeans next year. Ryan, every acre is going to be soybeans. Perfect. Ours too. <laughs> it it would be great if there was a third and fourth crop that we could come up with that all of a sudden there was a big market for because it would take some acres away from the corn and soybeans. I mean, I think it would only help to have some competition out there in our area. You know, Brian, you maybe have more crops down there. There's more competition for other other crops, but it is it is definitely predominantly corn and soybeans around us. You could get into sugar beets, I'm sure. We've got a lot of rocks. There are no sugar beets in our area. Really? None. Ireland, nothing? No. Hmm. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not getting into sugar beets. That's uh, <laughs> nothing I want. I like my sleep I a see, little bit. I a see you eyeballing that potato planter. You think that would work in Chicago gumbo? I don't know what you just Potatoes? said. Potatoes? <laughs> Buy it and find out. It'd be good content. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Sounds like an expensive crop to <clears throat> try out. Uh, speaking of your gumbo, um, the... Is this like a soup? Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm joking. <laughs> um, it's a I, hot dish. A casserole? No, a hot dish, Brian. Oh, boy. We're in the Midwest now. <laughs> That's Hot dish isn't a thing in Ohio? I mean, dishes are hot sometimes when they come out of the oven. <laughs> Usually, like, the casserole will be in a dish. <clears throat> That's fair. Yeah. We could have a whole episode just talking about the differences in things that we say versus things you say, I think. You guys still drink Sorry, pop, right? Definitely. Perfect. What was the made-up word you were talking about here a few minutes ago? Whopper job. <laughs> Whopper jod? Oh, my. Yeah. <laughs> Do I, need to, do, do I need to do a demonstration? Yep. The Look, were off. Chet's hat's whopper jawed, and now it's fine. It's whopper job. I don't have a comment other than that's not a word. <laughs> he messed up my hair again, guys. <laughs> Makeup. <laughs> I think this is some really, really good content for you guys on your channels to talk about, like, regional, I don't know, terminology. I'm going to just have to drop that word in a video now. And oh, see and see what the comments are that roll you're in. You're gonna get some emails from upset moms. <laughs> <laughs> you don't realize what the, it sounds the, like. The closed captioning will mess it all up for me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Hard to talk about the next one um, after this. Uh, the weather patterns, climate change, has that affected anything from um, anything on your farm from maybe when you started till now? The differences <clears throat> and what are you predicting in the future? for new patterns. I don't know about your guys' farm, but ours ours has always been inconsistent. <laughs> you never know if it's going to be hot, cold, dry, or wet. I mean, you get you get everything you can imagine, and you can't really, you know, you can only do so much to really predict it. So I'm not saying that the, that the climate change isn't a real thing, but I don't know that I've really seen, personally experienced any changes on our farm because of it. So one thing I noticed, I think where we live further <coughs> south, maybe seems like our frosts are maybe a little bit later than they used to be. Um, last year, this year, oddly enough, like you were saying, inconsistency. We had an early frost, but uh, in the last few years, we've been getting frosts like end of October, November, which is a lot later than it seems like it used to be. Because of that, we're able to grow double crop beans better. So double crop beans are beans after wheat is harvested. So you're freezing out end of October. We're not freezing out. We're getting a frost. Oh, like okay. A killing frost. Okay, I got gotcha. you. I'm not going to touch that one. <laughs> <laughs> Doug? Climate's always changing. Sure. Always has. Yeah, continue. Has anything uh, changed since you were a kid on the farm? What you're growing or anything or dates, anything like that? Well, I would agree. We are 
I think it does stay a little bit warmer into the fall. Um, but yeah, give it five more years, it'll be opposite maybe. Or sure. Okay. We did touch on this one before we started rolling, but um, what do you think about new people who want to try farming? Is it too expensive for somebody <coughs> new to get in? Brian? That's one of the questions I get asked a lot in YouTube comments is, can a, a first-generation farmer still make it? And I know several. I know several people that are first-generation in their 50s, their 40s, their 30s, and their 20s. So I 100% think it can still be done. I think there's going to be a lot of risk. You're going to have to take a lot of chances. And you could definitely go broke, but I think it could be done. You, you can go broke as a well-established farm, too. I know, yes, I know uh, <clears throat> one thing I always like to mention is if you want to get into farming, you don't have to start out with $3 million worth of equipment and 2,000 acres. There's a lot of really well-run niche farms on small acres. Maybe they don't even have machinery that are catering to, you know, direct-to-consumer markets. I think there's a lot of potential and opportunity for that right now. So, it, it, I mean, there's different ways to do it. Your farm doesn't have to look like the farms that you see on YouTube. One thing I notice in our area, several people I know that are first-generation farmers, um, so I have a, one of my dad's friends in his uh, late 50s, he started working for a guy, worked for him for 10, 15 years. That guy didn't have anyone um, to take over. Uh, he eventually started renting that guy's farms as he retired, and I've seen several people kind of get into farming that way, just uh, little by little. I'm starting out working for a guy as that guy retired. How about you guys? I would say it's possible. It depends the area. What know. generation are you, Chip? <clears throat> what was that? How, what, what generation are you, Chip? The, um, I'm fifth. Fifth, wow. Um, we big. do have a, a hired man that is, what well, you'd consider him first, right? Yeah, yeah. He's, He's definitely I mean, just His started. family had a farm, but it didn't work out for him to be there. Um, his parents are not farmers. Sure. Um, we built a relationship uh, as friends and turned into a working relationship, and now we are um, custom farming for him. Oh, okay. To get his feet wet, and you know, you got to start somewhere. Yep. You know, like Zach said, you don't jump in and buy three million dollars of equipment or even two hundred thousand when you can't even. You got to have someone sign There's for ways your around loan, it with... or you got to come in with cash, or. Whatever it takes, you know, you got to talk with a banker. It takes, I wouldn't say farmers have a lot of money. They deal with a lot of money. There's and a lot of money involved, it just takes a right? lot of overhead to put in an acre of corn. Yep. Is a staggering number cost per acre just to put it in. And you got to float that for the year. And, and that's 7% seven and seven operating line. That helps a lot. It's true. That is handy. Yeah. <laughs> big, big fan. <laughs> so I think it's possible we got one on our farm doing it. It's true. You first got to have the land, obviously. Yeah, that's going to be the even biggest Even just access problem. to renting something. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's where it starts. And yeah. my brother and I, that's pretty much how we started. Obvious, our grandpa and dad were never very large. At, grandpa had 80 acres. Dad had maybe another 300 and some acres. And... They just did not ever stick their neck out. Yeah, too they didn't far risk and anything. They weren't, and that's fine. That's totally fine. Like Zach said, farms are different. Um, yeah. So Randy and I, when we started, we just, if it was a little bit larger piece of equipment, we just uh, parked it underneath the tree and started fixing. It was all of the bigger farmers' old, used-up equipment sure. that we were buying. And, oh, gosh, the stories I could tell. <laughs> Do you think it's harder now than it was when you guys started for somebody to start fresh? I don't know. Us. I think about the equipment, the used equipment now. Because <clears throat> back when we started, it was 20 series combines. Well, maybe the 4,400 I bought that was my first combine. Do you guys even know what a 4400 is? Is that an open cab? 
<laughs> no, it, <laughs> there's it no air, air conditioning. Oh, that did have air conditioning on that one. Did it? Well, that was that. Which stuff. one? Which one was it that you had the the uh, church candles? Oh, that was that you had in the cab that you'd light to try to keep it warm. Right, it got so foggy inside. <laughs> you think I'm joking? I'm no, no, I know you're not joking. The problem was it would fog <laughs> up so bad. <laughs> Did the church ever find out you were stealing their candles? <laughs> Actually, maybe I shouldn't go there. <laughs> no. no it, I don't know if this equipment nowadays is the newer stuff or the bigger stuff. It just costs so much to fix that up unless you can still find a 20 series combine because all we needed to do is have a bunch of one inch bearings on hand and we kept it all going. But now the newer I don't know if you can. I don't think stuff's keep it built up. right like it was back then, too. It's know? definitely not be built to be fixed at a hardware store. I mean, yeah. the combines you're talking about. I mean, most of the parts were probably yeah. common at a hardware store at the time. I I think it's just <coughs> gonna it's gonna cost a lot more. I mean, it's gonna take a lot more money to. So one trend that I see, like in our area, um, anytime crop prices peak up, it just seems like there's a lot of guys that'll have a like a full time job at the mill or something. And they will jump right into farming, and it just seems like as soon as crop prices go down, back down, and they've played for a little bit, they realize it wasn't quite all they were, thought it was going to be. And I've seen that happen. Like every time the markets have went up and back down, um, it seems like there's always a flush of that happening in our area. Anyways, I, I think it's just people that don't quite have any a lot of experience in farming, and they have a different notion of how easy it's going to be, and and they find out. So it can definitely go the other way, I guess, is what I'm saying. Sure. I think that's bad. That's one of the maybe real bad things about farming. It, when it's good, it's good. And when it's bad, it it's bad. Real You've got to have the good years to absorb the bad ones. Or, yeah. you got to commit. Really. Average it out. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, we've, we've done some stories recently on record land sales in uh, North Dakota. I hear about, hear about them all the time across the upper Midwest. I Sure, it's similar in Ohio. What are your, what are your takes on current land values? We did talk about it a little bit earlier um, that they're probably not sustainable, especially with interest rates. But um, Zach, what are you seeing in your area or overall? Well, uh, we don't have much stuff moving in our area. I just haven't seen a quarter of land sell for quite a while. But um, yeah, we were talking about that earlier. I'm sure it would go for quite a bit right now if somebody had a nice quarter of land for sale. But you know, with the interest rate deal, I think that's, that's going to have to slow it up some because when you're talking about a quarter of land, it's not a small amount of money. So unless you're bringing cash to the table, which most guys are not, that, that interest rate is going to slow that down a little bit, I think. And, and obviously that's what they're trying to do with, with raising the interest rates. So I just don't see much moving around us as far as land sales. I don't you know what it's... it's a lot of um, stuff that doesn't even hit the market? Yeah, I mean, that's the way ag land, a ag land, however. You're going to say right for the Ohio folks. Egg, egg land. Um, that's the way that, that it's always been, you know, farmers, landowners, a lot of times they already know who they want to sell it to or they have people in mind. So a lot of it doesn't end up going on the, you know, at, to auction or or whatever, but um, but some of it does. And, and you, I just haven't seen a lot moving around us. So one thing my dad will always talk about is, way well, back in 1968, we could have bought that piece of ground there for $25,000, the whole farm. That was a lot of money back then. I said, yeah, but we don't own it, and that guy does, and he ain't ever selling it. And I just, I wonder if what people were, if they were having the same conversation, you know, 40 years ago. Like, and are we going to be having that conversation? Yeah, like, I can't believe we could have bought that for $10,000 an acre, and we didn't because it was too much money. Now we look like idiots. I, I want to say no. Like, I feel like $10,000 an acre is way too much money. But uh, just looking back at history, like, everybody in our area that continued to buy ground, I mean, 40 years ago, that's all paid off. They're sitting, you know, they're sitting really well now. So, like, I would like to buy as much ground as possible. But like you were saying, most of it's not coming up for sale, and um, that, that, that price tag's a little bit aggressive. One thing I've noticed a lot of people in our area... Like, we're in the Midwest, but we're kind of in the eastern end of the Midwest, and you have good ground, you have very poor ground, depending on where you're at, and they see land prices going out in Iowa or Illinois, and there's a farm down the road for us that is going, 
they're trying to sell it at a price that you would think it was prime Illinois dirt, and it's not. It's hill country with rolling pasture and no buildings or anything. It's like it's just not realistic. Do you think it'll sell for what they want, though? No. 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 Not to a farmer. Yeah. Deer hunter, maybe. That's also a thing in our area. I mean, you get people from the from the cities with a lot of money, and they want a deer farm. And, right. You know. hmm. I don't, I don't know. I would. Our area, there's. I'd say there's, there's a fair, fair amount, amount that's changing hands. <coughs> yeah, at auctions. Sure. Um, is this people like farmers retiring or dying out, or is this people inheriting land wanting to sell? Or? I would say a lot of it is that. There's a couple of retired ones and then estates and stuff like that, but it seems like once. I haven't seen anything be slow, yet. How cut I mean, is, uh, is it in your area? It's going, I mean, the land value is definitely going up. It's you get a nice, nice, it didn't take long, let's just say that. It went from stuff no sailing at 5,500, 6,000 an acre, and then sellers like, nope, not selling it, to overnight, basically, the market runs a couple bucks, and, oh, we're back $10,000 land. I mean, it didn't take long at all. Or what would you say, Zach? From yeah, your well, yeah, definitely. I. It's like people don't remember what no. the last <clears throat> $7 corn was like where it took a lot of sleepless nights after buying some of that stuff where it's like, oh, my gosh, we should have never paid 10000 Well, it didn't take long to get back to that value, so now you feel good. But do you want to buy more of it? <laughs> right. Well, and when corn is 6 or $7 and things are really profitable, you know, and, and interest rates are low, it's pretty tempting to look at that land and think like Brian, hey, in 20 years from now, I don't want to look at that and think, man, I could have bought that for eight or 10000 an acre. But you, chances are most guys are going to be spending 20 or 30 years trying to pay for that dirt. Mm -hmm. And corn is not always, corn, beans, whatever, it's not always profitable. Like, like Doug was saying, the highs are high and the lows are low. You got to make those payments in the low years too. What do you think they were making on an acre of ground 20 years ago? You, I mean, I'm, what I'm saying is I think that has also went up with the land prices. Right. I mean, yeah. I feel like our overall yields <clears throat> in the last 25 years have went quite up. I mean, the the economics always average out, right? They yeah. they, they just do. So making 20 bucks an acre in the 90s is a lot different than making $20 an acre now. You know, I mean nobody would be happy profiting 20 bucks an acre other than you're not going backwards but you know you, you hope for better than that mm -hmm. so it's all it's all an inflation thing ten thousand dollars now is not going to be the same as ten thousand dollars 20 years from now the crazy thing is there's parts of the midwest where ten thousand dollars an acre is dirt cheap i know it yeah <laughs> i know it let me tell you I mean, some our area that's mind-blowing <laughs> aren't there some of those areas and you were talking about where twenty thousands more more likely than 10, yeah, it's unbelievable. I can't even fathom that. I, that's that's, that's crazy. I don't ever see paying for it. <clears throat> I mean, I know that that's probably good dirt, but I just, I just man, I don't know. Potatoes, sugar beets, that kind of thing, I don't know. It's still, it's, but it's selling. That's, the market dictates what's happening. I don't know, it's crazy to me, and all of us, I guess, but. Maybe they're selling it to a solar farm. That's a thing in our area. <laughs> it's not as big in, in North Dakota as it is even in Minnesota. I don't think the perks are there. I don't think the set. perks are in Ohio either. Oh, really? They're, they're, it's still they're, happening. They're, they're, that's a different topic. I drive by uh, plenty of them in Minnesota, I, I guess, in the western side of the state anyway. And Most of them are smaller, yeah, and I, yeah, and I think not. a lot of it's driven by the subsidies behind it because the government's pushing it. They want to see that. So, so I think like 5,000 acres? No, no are, you, are you seeing 5,000 acre solar farms where you're at? There's a 3,000 and a 1,500 and a 5,000 within. No way. Whoa. Yeah. I'm I mean, seeing like five or ten <laughs> acre like little corners. Of uh, I'm talking like tearing out irrigation pivots to put up solar farms. Oh, we don't have that at all. Yeah. It's it, really sunny uh, in Ohio. Yeah, I it's guess. It's not. It's like we live in like the biggest fog. If you want to find out what kind of disease tolerance your corn hybrid has, you need to bring it to our area because there's fog every morning. Like I, it's the most depressing thing. Like I mean, I don't know. I, I'm very opinionated <laughs> on it. We can get back to the topic if you want. But, uh, <laughs> I'm not a fan. That's super interesting. Yeah, that is. Um, <clears throat> we're just full of uh, uplifting questions here, but um, <laughs> global uncertainty with uh, 
relations with China, Russia-Ukraine war, um, Russia and Ukraine and China are big producers of commodities. Are the, is it a big effect on you guys or kind of just an, one of those waves you need to ride kind of thing? Both. Both. Yeah, it's a, it's a big effect on us, but, I mean... What's the alternative? I mean, what do you do? Yeah, besides trying to manage and control what we can, what can you do about it? I mean, Putin and China are going to do going to do what they're going to do, and you can't really predict that. I know last year, whenever um, the, uh, the conflict ever started, um, wheat just went through the roof. Every day we were selling wheat at <clears> a new high. Like, we, we better sell. We've never seen wheat this high. And then next day, limit up. Next day, limit up. And, uh, I mean, it definitely affected things. But like you say, I mean, Not all bad for you. Not all bad, but I mean, at the same time, uh, a lot of inputs have went up because of that conflict. Right. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, there's definitely negatives with the positives. So. Larson Farms, any big impact out of the ordinary? I no, I would say everything you guys said. It it drove the market up, and it drove the fertilizer cost up with it. Yeah, it, out of our control. It it's all. Headlines, I think. I mean, you just got to follow the headlines. Yeah, you need to know what's going on over there, but the headlines are going to drive it. So, that, I mean, like I say, you got to just control what you can. I'm glad I'm over here, not over there. Yeah, that's, that's for sure. Unbelievable. <clears throat> I, st I mean, I can't believe that they were able to farm at all. I mean, I yeah. think they still got wheat exported. Like, I, that baffled me. I mean, I'm... I like combining. I don't know that I'd like combining dodging bullets. No. I mean, I've <laughs> seen Mortars, a combine get in a missiles. wreck. They don't wreck very well. No. <laughs> no, it's, it's wild. No, I'm, glad, I'm glad it hasn't been a, I mean, it's not fun to watch what's happening and all that stuff, but it's mm -hmm. glad it's not really uh, too big of a kick for you guys. Um, how were the supply chain issues that we've been dealing with since the beginning of the pandemic? Are things getting a little better? Uh, I think we've kind of touched on it inadvertently with, um, the price of things, especially goods. Um, if there's a shortage, we had a year of pickups, equipment, other cars, all sorts of stuff just not being produced, so you're missing a year class of all this stuff. Um, is, it, is it getting better on I'm, the farm side of things? I would say, like, fertilizer, chemical is maybe better. Machinery parts is not good. Still, still tough. Not I think they're doing better than everyone <coughs> thought they were going to do, but there's still some stuff that's very concerning, <laughs> like can't get it and back ordered for months. I Has think, I think the mechanical it? side of farming is still in a world of hurt. Has it changed your um, inventory? Like, are you are you keeping more parts on hand when they're available? Any of you guys? Like, are you? I think that kind of yes, we did. But it also is kind of like the, the toilet paper event. And same thing with the um, fertilizer and chemical shortage. I think everyone, it's like the toilet paper. Oh, there's, everyone's taking it and buying it. I better get some before, and you're overbuying. You ain't going to need it. There was a lot. Oh, of, you'll need it at some point. There were <laughs> a lot of bigger <laughs> shovels and planter openers that were useful <clears throat> that I... Everybody bought them because they were at a discounted price or the old pr price. So now, I don't know. Yeah, we, we could, bought we two years it. worth of digger shovels because they're like, well, they're going to double next them. year. So might as well bring them in. All right, well, guess what? That just, You're we just over they were making the, the, right, the, right. That, that happened? The prices did go up? Oh, yeah. Get to be yeah, we yeah. got them in the shed. We had two and a half years worth of digger shovels because it's like, well, they're going to double, I, and I know we're going to use them, them. We so just, why not? But then guess what? They'll, the next guy maybe needed them that spring, and they can't supply them. You know, that's just how it goes, just like the whole toilet paper. Start reselling them, Doug. Fill up that, yeah. that piggy bank again. <laughs> there you go. We just tried to have things that, like common wear parts that we knew we were – had a decent chance of needing like a Draper belt. At one point, Draper belts, for whatever reason, were back ordered for like months. Like, well, man, if we if we cut a belt in the middle of harvest, that's going to be a problem. So we now have six Draper belts for two different heads. I mean, that's not all. <laughs> we don't go through that many belts. I'm going to say it. I, I would hope not. I don't yeah. know about that. I've never <clears throat> ripped one. They're ripped one, huh? No. 
Let's hear this story, Brian. <laughs> I don't know. They, just, they wear out eventually. It must be the silver color. It, it's a McDonald's is what I'm talking about. <laughs> like we had a feeder house drum, or the drum on the McDonald fall out onto the belt. That, kind of, that was this year. Preventative maintenance <laughs> is the key to longevity of machine. It's a 15-year-old draper head, Chet. <clears throat> Pry bar when and well, check the bearings. The, when, when the, the drum the flies we, out of the machine, the that ain't a good thing. Snapped. <laughs> <laughs> we can watch the video later if you want. Okay, we'll do that. Did it make good content? There's a lot of beeping. <laughs> well, that, that's fun. Yeah, it was interesting. Yeah. <clears throat> well, we've asked a lot of tough questions that aren't the most fun to talk about, so I'm going to wrap this up with um, one of my old favorite questions from hosting the podcast. What is uh, the best book you've read recently or show you've binged recently? We'll start going in this order. Zach. Ah, uh, man. I don't hardly watch anything on anything. Uh, but uh, there's a Drive to Survive, the Formula One show on Netflix. That's like the one thing I, I get through every year. It was good? Yeah. It's always good? It's always good, yeah. But other than that, I don't think I've watched it. I mean, I just don't watch anything. So I don't have a good answer. You don't watch, watch your YouTube videos? I don't watch my videos. What about your I don't, here? Sorry, guys, but I, I, I'm, no, I don't watch your videos, and I know you don't watch mine either, so it's fine. <laughs> well, now I feel weird. <laughs> I watch The Millennial Farmer. <laughs> I, I'm trying to think. Um, like same, I mean, a lot of Peppa Pig. <laughs> a lot of Peppa Pig. Um, are you, a, are you a Bluey guy? Oh, Jesus, Bluey is the bane of my existence. You don't like him? Oh, uh, I thought it was a universal dad thing. Like, Bluey's a welcome thing to what, what is, go against Peppa Pig. What is Bluey? So how do, how do you spell that? Australia, blue with a Y at the end. It's, it's a dog. Just Australian it. dogs. Disney. Family. Disney app. Don't, lo- don't sound like something I could get into. Just if you have little time. kids, it beats a lot of alternatives. <laughs> I, I got that song stuck in my head now. <laughs> If my phone's ever on, I think my uh, text alert is that theme song. That's the one. <laughs> I've never seen that one. They're blue healers. Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Chet, what do you? What What goes on when you're not? <clears throat> oh, there's definitely YouTube? not reading. Okay, that's fair. I'm not Not a reader. Um, I did really get into the Yellowstone series. Did you? And the 1883. Is that the one? I believe so. That's the kind of like shows the settlers coming across it's a yellowstone very good everyone should watch what the ancestors went through to have maybe a little more appreciation of the this is a documentary wasn't it no no it's (laughs) very (laughs) they they recorded it into watching it i've seen it (laughs) no that that's a that is very good show i like that i think everyone should watch that to just have some appreciation of what settling this country was all about. I've asked the what, you, what are you streaming question in almost all of my podcasts. Uh, Yellowstone is by far the number one, and I still haven't watched an episode, and it drives me crazy. Just, But maybe it'll, it'll be one of those things where you just don't, you know, run into a cliffhanger, and there's just so much of it to watch. I don't know. I'll get around to it. It's pretty good. Someone pointed out to me that it's Sons of Anarchy with Cowboys, and I was like, hmm, that might have ruined it for me. I don't know. It it is from what I've seen. That's exactly what it is. But Sons of Anarchy. Are you the one that pointed it out. You ruined it. I, I might have been. I might have been. Uh, Sons of Anarchy is one that I got all the way through. But that was like eight years ago or whatever. Yeah, at the end. That was, huh? Did you cry at the end? No. Oh, just. Me. <laughs> but I I've seen several episodes of Yellowstone and it is the same. Similar. Yeah. Okay. I I like Sons of Anarchy too. Yeah. Doug, what do you got? Well, I, you better put a claimer or disclaimer in there because the language is pretty rough. The first episode we watched, Amy had to leave. She couldn't, <laughs> she couldn't handle it. But On Yellowstone? Yeah. Okay. But yeah, otherwise, I no, I don't watch too much TV and reading. <laughs> yeah, I'm kind of with Chet on that, but uh, unless I should say Egg Week. I love hearing that. That's yeah. what I love to hear. Brownie points for you. I'll slip you a $5 bill later. Okay. All right, guys. Well, we have a busy day ahead of us at the Full Pod event here in West Fargo that Curry's putting on. Excited to see what's going on. We'll do a little more chatting with each of you individually later, but thank you for joining us on the podcast. Looking forward to seeing this 
come to life and share your insights with, with our listeners and um, Curry's website visitors and all that good stuff. Yeah, it was fun. Glad to be here. Thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you.